For the next 15 minutes, I am going to give you a glimpse of the online atlas, which we are actually launching today. Ta-da! And, uh, yeah. Well, wait, uh, wait to see what it has to offer. But the main purpose of the uh, online atlas is to really find a, a mechanism to translate a lot of our research from you know, squiggly Greek letters and equations to something that can be useful to people um, who are actually making decisions, particularly in the topics that we really care about, which is how countries can grow, how countries can diversify. This started as a collaboration with the Media Lab at MIT and Harvard, where we just wanted to make available all this data that fueled the theories that uh, Ricardo um, has led on economic complexity. We had data of 1,000 products, 128 countries over 50 years, and we put them online in an easy to understand way so that anybody who had access to the internet could have access to this data. And at CID, we've been working on, uh, on, on building on that so that we can not only understand trade flows and who imports and exports products, but maybe we can also predict them and even affect them. So I, um, I know that you get bombarded with data in your jobs all the time, so what I hope is to just give you a few examples of the kind of things that you can see and hopefully uh, find it useful. So it can answer very simple questions. Like for example, who do you think is the largest exporter of chocolate? What do people think? Ivory Coast, Belgium, well actually, Germany is the biggest producer of chocolates uh, or exporter of chocolates. And you can see, you know, Belgium is second. But this is a uh, tree map that tells you of all uh, the exports in 2011, Germany exported 60% of the whole market. So if I were to ask who is the biggest importer of hard liquor? China. 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 Yeah, this is less hard, the US. And I don't have the data, but this has probably doubled since the government shut down. Um, <laughs> we can also see things that are kind of um, dynamic. You can see an industry and how it evolves and have hypotheses about them. So for example, if I were to tell you the flower industry in the Netherlands, who here thinks this is like an exciting industry that it's growing? Who would invest? Raise your hands. All right, maybe a couple people. All right, so let's see a couple pictures of, uh, that, that can give you a glimpse of, on how this is doing. So how big is the flower industry for the Netherlands? It's actually not that big. It's um, you know, only 1% of its total export basket at over $3 billion. Now how big is those uh, 3 to $4 billion in world markets? Well, actually, the Netherlands has 50% um, of the world market in flowers, uh, in exports. So, and has that been increasing through time? We see um, that actually it hasn't. Only 15 years ago, and these are all things you can see in the online atlas, it was 60%. So let's look at, uh, at how this has been evolving through time. So you can, um, so let's look at who's buying flowers. We see in a stacked graph that we could also show since 1995, for a market like Germany, which is a very big market, the Netherlands has totally dominated and continues to not dominate with over 95% of the market. Other countries, like the US, actually have seen you know, um, Ecuador and Colombia leaving Netherlands very little room to compete in the US. And in other places, like uh, Japan, which used to be a huge market for the Netherlands, China and Korea have totally taken uh, their market share away, uh, share away. So after only a few visuals, if I were to ask you, what does the market look like in 2020? You would have probably a different answer on whether you know, Dutch supremacy in the flower market is going to be um, maybe challenged by these emerging markets. And we actually have this new data we just put in the new atlas of 2011, where the Netherlands has already fallen to 45%. So at least it even gives you a hint if you're a Dutch producer where the risks are coming from. So this is one set of applications that we have. And the other ones have to do with the product space on predicting growth and diversification. And I'm going to give a quick explanation for few of you who haven't seen this picture before. So this is what we call the product space. Um, and uh, 
what every node in this product space is a product. And uh, so we have here the cluster of you know, garments. And literally, this is probably shirts for men. This is shirts for women. This is blazers. These are actual products. This is not a theoretical um, exercise. These are um, uh, construction, machinery, uh, chemicals, electronics, et cetera. And the, way, the reason this is important for a lot of our theories on how we predict growth is that the shape of this map really matters for how countries move through this product space. This is the product space of Spain. So the product space is the same for every country. But it's Spain because the products that Spain produces uh, with strength are actually colored in bright colors. So the analogy that Ricardo uses, which I think is really powerful, is think about this as a forest, where every node is a tree and every firm is a monkey. And in a country, you want, and this is one of the things he has proven, that countries grow when they diversify. So countries grow when their monkeys jump in this forest and take over the forest. Now, the implications of the shape of this forest are important for development, in that if this was had an homoge homogeneous shape and every node was separated by the same amount, then we would know that development would just be a matter of time. But this shape means that if your monkeys are in this area, they're going to jump around very easily because monkeys jump only short distances. But if you are in far places up here with agriculture that is oil, it's harder for you to, uh, to jump. So as he was speaking today, this uh, is an example of, um, another way to look at it is a map of capabilities. When capabilities, you know, similar capabilities are clustered in the products that you can produce. So, the intuition of this is that if we go closer to it, is that if you are a country that produces motor vehicles here in this bat fat circle, you are also likely to be able to produce in the future and have the capacity to make harvesting and threshing machines because it's very close to it. And, uh, and this can be helpful in uh, where you are in the product space matters, right? So um, if we think of a couple countries, and trying to understand their dynamic using the product space. Mexico, Chile, very similar income per capita. If I were to tell, ask you, which one do you think holds you know, higher promise for growth? Who would say Mexico? Who would say Chile? All right, we're kind of divided. Well, if you look at their product spaces, you can see a kind of clear picture in our model that Mexico is actually in very interesting parts of the product space. It's in machinery, it's in these clusters of electronics. You know, it actually came into textiles and left. It's, it's in central areas, which we think means that they have a very exciting prospect for growth because they'll be able to jump easily to nearby products, and they have the capabilities to do so. Compared with Chile, who um, actually has only stayed in the periphery, you have, you know, uh, fish and agriculture and copper, but has not managed to kind of enter in places where that acceleration could be faster. And if we look at the product space of time, all that you can see in the Atlas Online, you'll see how it's progressed since 1960s, 70s, 75. You can see how they've entered here, left there, taken over the electronics cluster through time, joined this home, you know, construction sector, entered uh, chemicals, and Chile has stayed in the periphery, probably producing more of the same things. So, and the implications of that is that if, you know, they're very strong in salmon production, but if something, some disease hits salmon, it's not easy for them to move to tuna, right? Well, if something happens to the toaster ovens here uh, for Mexico, they can move into, you know, microwave machines and, you know, waffle makers or whatnot. So it's also a more resilient economy based on what we can see in the product space. So based on this and where you are in the product space, we can actually predict, and we do predict the growth prospects of every country in the world, and this is in the online atlas, until 2020. And the way we do that is we look at the complexity of their economies, we look at where they are in the product space, and we compare that to their current GDP per capita. Because we have an expectation of how rich you should be given the complexity of your economy. And if you are much poorer than what we would expect, like let's say India, and, uh, and China, then we think you're going to accelerate your growth to match the actual complexity of what you're building right now. And other countries who are richer than we would have expected given their complexity, let's say like Greece, we think they're going to slow down. 
So based on that, you know, we're very excited and bullish on Mexico, much more than compared to Brazil. Um, very excited about East Africa. We think like everybody else, China and India are going to grow, India a little more. And we're also bullish about Eastern Europe. But all of this is, um, is in this application. So that's great. We can, you know, uh, predict or think we can predict uh, growth in the future and where countries are going to go. But part of our business in the center here is to also help countries maybe accelerate that process, right? So what if you're stuck in the periphery? Can you do something about it to change your trajectory? And here's where we think we have some tools that can help some actors. So let's say, you know, this is a country and you are a city planner, you're the governor of a state. This is, and, uh, and you've just created a brand new industrial park, shiny, and you want to, you know, bring investors. And you have a couple takers of a car company or manufacturer, an airplane manufacturer. And you have limited resources to subsidize and, uh, and you know, to encourage these firms to come. How do you make that choice? Who would you choose? Who would choose to bring the car company? Who would choose to bring the airplane company? There's more people than three hands. You gotta make a choice. Let's try again. So who would bring car company? You've got some. All right, who would bring airplanes? Okay. Well, so you can see if you bring cars, actually cars are smack in the center of the, uh, um, of the product space. And you see, which you can see in the Atlas Online, all the neighbors, all the products that are likely to emerge and have similar capabilities than, um, than the manufacturer of cars. So we would expect that if, you, if, if cars really enter this economy, that those other products are likely to emerge. And one of them is car parts that tend to locate close to car companies. And if we look at car parts, they actually tend to have a bunch of different neighbors, right? Okay, so this sounds exciting. Let's look at airplanes, which is a very sophisticated product. It's here, it's in the periphery. And it actually has one neighbor, explosives. Not to judge, right? And the point is not that airplanes are not sophisticated, it's that the knowledge that you require to make airplanes is very particular and it's not easily redeployed for other things. It's not bad that Brazil chose to you know, invest actually in airplanes, but it's very hard to use those, uh, those, um, those skills for, other divers for diversification. So we also think, like if you think of, uh, of countries, you know, and countries' choices. Let's look at a lackluster country like Guatemala, right? It has grown very slowly, even by Central American standards. And if you look at their production basket, you know, they, this is uh, exports per capita. They haven't grown a lot, and they've kept producing the same things. A lot of fruits and vegetables, some um, more processed goods. And then they went into, uh, into textiles heavily, but textiles has increased, decreased, uh, probably because they all left to Bangladesh. And, uh, and what you can do with the, um, with the online atlas is see the possibilities for Guatemala, very specific and particular to the current productive capabilities of that country. And these are every product that Guatemala does not produce with strength in the world. And this is distance, which means how easy would it be for Guatemala to enter that product, and complexity, which is you want to move up into the complexity. And, and average complexity is around here for Guatemala. So if we look, let's say, for your bubble, of course everybody wants to be there, but that's not feasible, because as Ricardo has shown, monkeys jump short distances. We cannot you know, jump into all, to all of those. We've got to go um, to things that are closer to our current productive structure. So if we look at the bubble that's closest to, our pro to Guatemala's productive structure and the most um, complex, we get to this blue bubble here, which is refrigerators and freezers. And actually, Ricardo and I went to visit this anomaly of a monkey that was in, in, uh, in, in Guatemala, and we found out that yes, there was, as we can see, you know, $3 million of, uh, of, of exports from Guatemala, um, because some Siemens company had come 30 years ago and then had left, but a lot of the engineers it had trained had stayed and built their own freezer companies. So we said, okay, that's an interesting industry for, for Guatemala because it had helped them move. And, you know, the freezer market is, is, is growing. The U.S., which is a neighbor, is the biggest market and also growing. And we can even go further and understand, all right, so the U.S., where does the U.S. Import, import its refrigerators and freezers? Oh, from Korea, China, a lot of Mexico, maybe there are places where we can take market share, and so, and so on. So these are the kind of things that we can do with the current um, Atlas Online. 
So before I end, I just want to give you a couple things that we think we're going to very soon be able to put in it. Um, one of them is that we can now predict which, um, which countries are, are uh, in every country, which industries are likely to emerge and which industries are likely to disappear in that country. And so you'll be able to see by product, let's say cars, um, which countries are likely to continue to produce and which cars and which ones are likely to, to drop that industry in the next five to 10 years, and which wha with what concentration. We already have this information. Um, we're also very excited about moving to subnational levels. This is information that Juan Pablo Chauvin, one of our fellows, is working with the US data, where he's already mapped um, the complexity of each county in the US. So it's new definition of red states. But uh, we think. Um, that we are working with people in this room actually to do hopefully in the near future subnational maps of countries like Colombia, Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, um, and uh, and so so that you can make decisions where where decisions are usually made, which is at a very local level. Um, and and lastly, um, we're also in leading with the with with what Ricardo spoke about in the research of Frank and Michele and others is that we'll be able to give much more detailed input on what you need to diversify. So we know that to diversify, to get into a product, you need a bunch of non-tradable inputs that are the things that allow you to put all these pieces together and skilled labor. And we now have understanding exactly of what skilled labor goes into making planes. So these are, for example, the top 10 professions that you need and capacity that you need to borrow, you know, build or steal uh, to, if you wanted to, to, to create uh, an airplane industry in your country. And we also know, with, uh, uh, through Michele's research, uh, what did these people who are currently aerospace engineers or aircraft mechanics, what did they study in university? So again, it can help understand, we hope we can provide inputs to that um, um, function of diversification so that it can be sped up in countries. And, and there you have your airplane. So this is it. I hope I've just spurred your curiosity enough that you will write down this URL and, uh, and, give, us, uh, and give us feedback on, on this work. And again, the way that we make this possible is we uh, have created this set of partnerships with what we've called our founding members of the Atlas of Economic Complexity, which are partners, many of whom are in the room, who are funding and supporting our research, and we're also working with them to get this tool to be incorporated within their organizations so they can use them and also provide us feedback. Um, and that's it, so thank you very much. And one last thing, um, I wanna, um, if you have questions about this, everybody at CID would be very glad to answer any of them. And I wanted to introduce Roman, who is the person behind building this, who, uh, who yes. <laughs>